Well, the original score for the theatre production began in 2007, and uh, at that stage, very little really was known musically what would what the score would be for the show. Um, but like all theatre, especially at the National Theatre level, uh, scores like this tend to be developed organically and one's in the rehearsal room at quite an early stage. So I went into the rehearsal room, um, as I say, pretty much uh, quite early on in, in rehearsals when they were still developing puppets and so on. And at that stage, it was uh, really just about throwing a bunch of different material uh, around in a rehearsal room and, and seeing what happened. Uh, and so one of the first things I did was to take in a bunch of pre-existing orchestral music, 20th century orchestral music, some 19th century, quite a lot of Mahler, Stravinsky, uh, Walton, various bits and pieces. And uh, I literally just chopped up little phrases from various big symphonic works of those composers and uh, put them across a, a sampling keyboard, and which I had with my laptop, and I took that into the rehearsal room. And then if we ran a battle sequence or something that we knew would involve the use of music, uh, we would literally say to the actors, right, go. And uh, I would go, try that one, uh, try that one. Oh, that piece, that chunk works quite well, and that, that doesn't. So very, very loose and very random, but what that does is start to give us an idea of what kind of music works for a scene and what doesn't. So it's very, very vague, but early stage. Uh, and that's all the score was at that stage. You could even argue that in the rehearsal room, the score wasn't my music at all. It was just these guidelines, these fence posts, if you were, showing us this stuff. And then later on, once we were into the meat of rehearsals proper, so that's after that workshop stage, uh, we started to uh, pick up on some of the more general uh, dramatic themes of what the, the, the play is about. And that involved long discussions with the directors about it, Tom Morris and Marianne Elliott, uh, finding out what the lives of the characters were, the context of it, the geographical context, the historical context, all these things. It's all important information which feeds into why you make a particular musical choice rather than another one. So that's the development of the score at that stage, the National, and um, that's eventually what went on stage. Uh, and it got tweaked and improved in its second year when it came back uh, in the Olivier Theatre. And then uh, around about 2010, which was around about the time we were uh, transferring it to the West End, um, it became sort of evident to me really that this orchestral music should really have a, a life of its own in the concert um, arena. Um, but that's, that's quite a big job because the music as had been developed at the National was all based on samples and, uh, and that kind of thing translating that into a performable score by uh, a symphony orchestra obviously is you know is, is quite a, a substantial undertaking but the other element of that is that it's not just about the uh, the instrumentation and the orchestration the the format of the of the piece originally was for a stage play so it consists of lots of different cues that's not something that you can put really in front of a, a concert audience uh, devoid of any other elements because you need to write something that tells its own story and that stands up dramatically. So the, so the Warhol Suite, which was in 2010, was my attempt to take the music from the show and sort of strip it back to its original elements and attempt to construct a sort of proper narrative, musical narrative with it in the style of a, um, a symphonic tone poem. So that's what I did with, um, with Warhol Suite. The concert version is another version again, uh, which really goes back to the idea of presenting um, a narrative more really in, in the way that the play does, because Michael Morpurgo tells the story on stage. He reads the book and the music uh, complements and, uh, and intersperses that reading. So, uh, Unlike the suite, which came in 2010, the, the burden of the storytelling 
has been taken off the music entirely and is now being shared with the telling of the story verbally. So what made sense, therefore, was to, to go back to more the musical form of the cues as they were in the show uh, and, and to look at it from that point of view and to enhance and, and develop and um, improve those musical cues, but sitting around the telling of the story. Now, the, the, the spoken version of the story that Michael reads obviously is not the same thing as the play, it operates in, an, in a, a different uh, dramatic environment. In the narrated version of the book, the horse speaks, um, whereas uh, in, the, in the play, obviously, the horse is, is mute and the, and, the, and the horse simply observes and absorbs everything that's going on around him. So the, the, the ways the stories are told are different for those two things. Having said that, the musical cues for the concert version uh, are much, much closer, in some cases more or less identical, um, to, uh, the, uh, to, to the way that the show uh, works. It's just that the, the big difference, obviously, is that the music is presented by a live orchestra. Uh, and so the, the burden on me as a, as a composer is to go and orchestrate that properly for a live bunch of players, because before I had studio resources and all that kind of thing, now one doesn't have that. So that was the big task, really, for, for the concert version. Yes, the concert version does expand and, and improves uh, on the, the, the play's music, I, I guess primarily in, in as much as when you're writing music for the play and you're, especially during the, the period called the tech and the previews, you know, where you're, you're shaping it and you're getting it on stage and you're presenting it to an audience, there's a lot of... Uh, practical changes that have to happen just in terms of length or you know any any kind of number of, of practical reasons which meant that that in the play uh, the music may have been truncated or in some other way compromised uh, and so an example of that might be that um, uh, in my original conception of dead and at peace let's say which is the the, the very opening musical number um, that's something, when I originally wrote it, that, that probably played for about twice its length compared to what it is now in the play. Um, and you have to do it that way around because you have to, it's easy to write too much music and then cut it down rather than to discover in the heat of the moment, uh, especially in the tech when you've got everybody breathing down your neck, uh, to find out that it's too short. Um, and if you do find out it's too short, often you've only got time to sort of rather crudely just repeat something or, you know, maybe make the whole thing go a bit slower. So it, that kind of change is, um, is, it's great to be able to sort of go back to the original version and, and it has more of a musical logic and more of a, it breathes musically more, uh, closer to its original conception compared to, you know, what you have to do in a play, which is often more practical and often more brutal really. Musical influences and resonances. Definitely uh, early, early 20th century English composers, uh, Vaughan Williams, uh, Walton actually as well, but not necessarily early 20th century. There are some 20th century composers more leaning towards the middle and some of them actually not even uh, English. Honegger is another one. Honegger's Third Symphony, for example. Um, Going back to Walton, Walton's first symphony, Vaughan Williams' fifth symphony, uh, and some Benjamin Britten as well. Now, these are not things which are pertaining to the First World War, but the, the reason why those sound worlds seem to resonate for this was that uh, there was a lot of uh, music around the time of the Second World War which just has a certain kind of heavy heart about it. Uh, and you can hear it in the writing. You can especially hear it, for example, in, in Honegger's Third Symphony. So whilst they're not necessarily contemporaneous with this story, it just seemed right and somehow appropriate to you know, bring that sound world uh, in. And in any event, the musical style um, of the piece changes. We start off in Devon, which is all very bucolic and you know, quite Vaughan Williams-y maybe. Um, but what happens in the story of, of this 
of this play and in this book is that people's lives move from from this very peaceful world and gradually just get more and more minced up on the on the battlefields um, in France and the music needs to reflect that so the, so the music changes and becomes gradually more and more mechanistic more and more brutal uh, unrelenting dissonant um, so those uh, those pieces that I mention, I just remember at the time when I was writing, just being in the background. Uh, certainly with things like Walton One, the, the rhythms in those, sort of relentless energy. Uh, and in Honegger, just some of the really wistful sort of sound of the harmony. Uh, lots, lots of different elements, really, but they all just somehow come together uh, in one psyche when you're, when you're writing things like this.